Hi friends and welcome back to the channel and welcome to my current favorites. In this video, I will be sharing with you the anime, books, and films that I've really enjoyed recently, so like the past summer, and I will also be sharing with you some of the things that I got for my birthday. There is a lot to cover in this video, so please be sure to check out the timestamps on the play bar as well as in the description box if you just wanna jump to what you wanna see. But in any case, grab a drink grab a snack, watch this while you are winding down or getting ready for your day, whatever it is, just know that this is a long chatty video and I hope you're ready. Now, let's begin. First up, we have The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa. So this is a Japanese science fiction novel about the trauma of loss. So it's set on an island where objects are disappearing and it tells a story of a writer who tries to cling onto her writing and her editor as like a last way to preserve what it once was. This is a haunting, hypnotic, patient, gentle, and eerie and beautifully sad story. It shows you the horrors and forgetting and the beauty and the despair of knowing that everything in life is fleeting and transient. The writing style is simple and concise and it is descriptive when it needs to be and it kind of reminds me of Haruki Murakami's writing style so if you like his work you should definitely check this one out. I love the structure, I love the premise, I love how Ogawa captured the pain and the dread of forgetting something and not knowing what you forgot and the dread of knowing that you are on the precipice of more doom. It just left like a knot in my stomach that was difficult to untangle. It's that incompleteness, that yearning, that melancholy that I love when it comes to reading novels like this. I hope I got my message across. Next one is Oyasumi Pun Pun or Goodnight Pun Pun by Asano Inio. This manga is about a young boy named Pun Pun whose innocence has reached its end after his father is arrested for spousal abuse and his mother is put in the hospital. He faces a series of events in love, lust, loss, and everything in between, which, for better or for worse, changes him forever as he grows into adulthood. This manga is a masterpiece. And I don't like throwing that word around, but seriously, my goodness, Oyasumi Pun Pun is a great piece of literature. I just love the tone and style. It starts off comical, quirky, whimsical, just to highlight that sense of youth of naivete, of innocence in Pun Pun's childhood. And as the story progresses, it gets darker, twisted, more morbid, grotesque, bleak, gritty, and grounded. There is genuine characterization in these characters. And that's what I love about the story is that even though I may not like the characters and the actions they take and the things they say and the thoughts they have, I can see myself in them, like I can see traits of myself in them, and that's what makes fantastic writing. There are realistic portrayals of love, of lust, of the messiness of ourselves, the messiness in human relationships, whether that be familial relationships or romantic ones. Also, I love how we never get to see Pun Pun. We never get to see his face. As you can see from the artwork right here, it's just a bird. And I love that choice that was made by the mangaka because I feel like how good looking a character is can dictate your relationship you have towards that character. So through seeing him as a bird, I was more focused on his actions, his behavior, his thought patterns, and his words. And I think that's really compelling. The art style is astonishing. Oh my goodness, it is beautiful and it is mad and it is absurd and morbid and it's photorealistic and it's gritty and at times quite grotesque. I think it is unforgiving and unafraid to plunge into the depths of absurdity and morbidity. I will warn you, if you cannot quite stomach and cannot quite take um, depressing material, material that heavily leans towards nihilistic thought and existentialist thought, then this may not be the one for you. But I really enjoy material that really puts me in a different headspace and that can get me quite sad. Luckily, I have the healthy coping mechanisms to get myself out of it, but I really enjoy reading dark, dark material, and that's just me. I know that it may come as a shock because how I portray myself online and the things that I provide value to you online here are more optimistic, more positive, more like, here is how you can be your best self. But for me personally, as an individual, I really enjoy reading really dark, really depressing, really heavy material. That's just me. That's just like another side of me, so yeah. 
I watched a lot of anime this summer and only two made it to my favorites list. And when I say favorites, it's not like top to your favorite. It's like out of all of the things I've watched, these two are the two that I enjoyed the most. And first one is Demon Slayer the movie Mugen Train. The events of Demon Slayer the movie takes place right after the events of the final episode of the Demon Slayer anime season one. And it's basically about how there are a bunch of mysterious incidents happening on a train. And we've got Tanjiro, Zenitsu, and Inosuke teaming up with the Hashira, Rengoku. And they are all on this train to figure out what the hell is going on. And they're there to protect and save the passengers. So the whole movie takes place on a train. It had the same tone and style and atmosphere as season one. It was just shorter and more contained and less deep and detailed, if you know what I mean. Because, you know, the movie runtime is like in around two hours. I really wish we got to see more about the supporting characters, but I guess I could just read the manga. The animation was glorious. The fight scenes were beautiful, especially Rengoku's fight scenes. Oh my goodness. And I really enjoyed Zenitsu's fight scene on the train. It's just seeing lightning and also fire being animated in such detail is, oh, it is such a treat. The music is phenomenal. I mean, Yuki Katira is like one of the best anime composers out there and her work does not disappoint. I feel like the movie was lacking overall, but I mean, season two is coming out soon and I think there are two parts to it. So I am very excited. The second one is 86. 86 tells the story of um, there's this Republic and then there's like this empire and they are at war and they've been at war for years. And the Republic's higher ups have told their people that, you know, we've got these automaton like drones fighting this war. So we've got no casualties, but that's all propaganda because the Republic is made up of 85 protected factions. And these people all have the same hair color, same eye color, so they all look the same. It's an incredibly homogenous group. And then you've got another faction just outside that's not protected and that's called the 86th faction. And these are humans. They weren't born with the same hair color or eye color, so they were deemed as like not even human, which kind of sounds like an interesting historical parallel. The kids in that 86th faction actually fight that fight against the Empire's drones slash autonomous bots. And it tells the story of this girl who is from a noble family and she's a major. She has to captain the 86 faction fighters in this war. And it follows her journey in having her ideals shattered and having her mind open to really the extremities of war and the inequalities, the oppression and the discrimination the 86th faction faces just because they don't look like what the other 85 factions look like. And it's incredibly ambitious. It's a shame that it was only 12 episodes because I think that it would have done better if it was paced slower and that there was more world building and in-depth characterization because I felt like it was still lacking. Like you could tell where certain plot points were going. I could predict them easily. And I knew that this character was gonna serve this kind of subplot, etc. It's just obvious. But this anime kind of reminds me if Attack on Titan kind of meshed with Neon Genesis Evangelion. The OP and EDs are fantastic. The music is composed by Hiroyuki Sawano who did Attack on Titan famously and he does not disappoint, obviously. Also, the voice acting was really good and the animation was great. I just felt like the story and the character building was lacking, but that is just me. First movie I have for you is A Brighter Summer Day, directed by Edward Yang. A Brighter Summer Day is a 1991 Taiwanese epic teen crime drama film, and by epic, I mean four hours long. This movie is set in the late 1950s to the early 1960s, and it tells the story of Xiao Si, a boy from a middle-class home who goes through the growing pains of growing up as he gets swept into juvenile delinquency. Have you ever watched a movie and after watching it, it left you in some kind of way? Like after the movie ends, you only realize that you're back in reality and yet somehow your perspective and the way you view yourself has shifted a little. And that's what this movie did to me. It left me in the sense of yearning, of melancholy, of lonesomeness, of hope in that these growing pains of adolescence will quickly subside. Edward Yang was a masterful director. You could tell that every choice he made was so deliberate and so needed. The casting was definitely on point as well. The actors did a phenomenal job. You feel like this movie is an overall portal or a time capsule. I felt like a fly on the wall. 
and I was able to watch all these people live, struggle, love, learn, hurt, and suffer. This film does a beautiful job of showcasing the complexities of what growing up looks like, what having ideals shattered looks like, how a cultural and political shift can shake up the individual, and so much more. If you have the time and you have the emotional space, please do check out this film. For the last film, we have 12 Angry Men, directed by Sidney Lumet. 12 Angry Men is a 1957 courtroom drama that tells the story of a jury of 12 men who have to deliberate the conviction or acquittal of an 18-year-old defendant who is accused of having stabbed his father to death. Basically, the entire movie takes place in a courtroom with all these jurors who could range from various backgrounds and personalities that need to come to an agreement of whether or not this 18-year-old boy is guilty or not guilty. Now, you may think, oh, watching a bunch of men in a room talk for like an hour and a half that's not very exciting i hear you but it is exciting firstly there is fantastic writing so the words in this movie just carry the film forward with flying colors the dialogue discourse and drama between characters that tension that builds up between everyone is so rich there is fantastic directing the choice of camera angles are really smart you can feel the power balance shifting within frames due to the director's choices and fantastic acting holy crap oh my gosh it felt like i was watching a play as an actor i was blown away by everyone's performances it was so grounded in circumstance i could feel the conflict and intensity heighten between various characters due to their difference in morals and values overall what a great classic film Alrighty, now we are shifting gears a little and I will be sharing with you some of the things that I got for my birthday. I do want to say that growing up, I really never celebrated my birthday. It was just another day in the year and I never wanted to make a big fuss about it due to like, you know, our family's like financial situation and whatnot. I just didn't want to burden anyone that I knew that you had to get something for me for my birthday. But during these past few years, I've been really blessed to have a lovely circle of friends and family that are gracious and generous enough to gift me beautiful gifts and that I am so thankful for. So I am here to share with you some of them. First up, we have the Bose headphones. These are wireless, but you can use a wire if you wanted to. This is Bluetooth oriented. I've never used headphones ever in my life and to now finally own a pair is pretty great. And let me show you what they look like on me. I feel like they look kind of funny. <laughs> Next one is this hard drive that my brother got me. Thank you very much, Adrian. I really needed this because I have no space on my computer. And so I need a hard drive to hold all of my documents, my videos, my thumbnails and all that good stuff. Next up, I got this card capture Sakura shirt. Look at it. Sorry, I didn't iron it yet, but ah, it's so cute. Um, for those who don't know, I love anime and I also love Cardcaptor Sakura. I always wanted an anime t-shirt of her and now I have one. Next up, I have this Zara pouch. It's like this little travel kit that I got from my mom as one of my presents. Thank you so much, mom. Just open it up and I can put like, you know, my makeup supplies or my beauty products in here. It's great to travel with and it's a great little pouch that you can bring if you need to do touch-ups. Next up, I have this brown dress that I got from H&M. I bought it for myself as a little birthday gift. It just looks like this. Let's move this. So it looks like this. I like it. I don't own any long dresses, so I wanted to get one for myself. I was also gifted two books. First one is this one. It is called Being Mortal, uh, Medicine and What Matters in the End by Atul Gawande. Quick little ramble. I just want to say in general, this is generally speaking, I think in Western society, because I am in Canada right now, I think that a lot of people fear death or fear the idea of what it means to age and pass away and are afraid to explore that idea because it's kind of taboo. Nobody wants to talk about aging. Our culture is so heavily focused on youth and how to stay as young as possible. So this book really discusses how medicine can age in the process of one nearing the end of their life. So it can talk about a lot of more freeing ways of palliative care of hospice so that they can live their last weeks, 
last months in a beautiful, rich, and dignified way. Last but not least, we have this massive screenwriting textbook, and this is The Writer's Journey. It's basically just a screenwriting textbook, and I really wanted this book, and now I have it. And yeah, that's it. Alrighty, this is the end of the video. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you have gotten up to this far, I am sorry for rambling and talking and tangents and whatnot. I have a lot to say and I like to give as thoughtful and as in-depth of an answer as possible. I don't necessarily like just scratching the surface. That's just the kind of person I am. I hope you don't mind. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And yeah, I will see you in the next one. Bye.